Hi, everyone. Good evening. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. We are really honored to have Poet Tahin Das here with us, um, hosting him for the first time here at Smith College. Um, tonight's programming will be a little bit different um, than some of the other readings we've done in the past. Um, and just in the sense that um, Tahin will begin tonight with a presentation on Bangladesh and his own political history. And that'll be followed by Tahin reading a selection of his work, um, which will be followed in turn um, by uh, Tahin being in conversation with Yona Harvey. Um, and then that, as always, uh, that conversation will be followed by a book signing right over here at the purple table. Tablecloth. Um, so along those lines, I want to thank our uh, local independent bookstore, bookseller, Broadside Books, um, for selling Dehean's books out there in the atrium. Exile Poets, Poems, and the Labyrinth of Homesickness is available for purchase. Um, and also, after the reading, if you also just want to come up and say hi, um, please feel free to do that. Um, that's also a chance for you all to ask questions um, and contact, uh, to connect with Tahin after the event. Um, we also have, um, I hope you all know this, um, uh, I haven't mentioned it in the past, but, um, or this season, but we do have the postcards by all of our visiting poets out there on the back table. Um, make sure, those are designed by our core interns. Um, they are available also after the event, anytime you want to come by in the Poetry Center. Um, but um, grab one of those on the way out too, um, if you are interested. Um, there's some really beautiful cards and poems uh, that are free for the taking. Um, I want to thank uh, Dan, Tom, and Jeff, our tech team for our tech crew tonight, um, for making our online streaming possible. Um, and I also, for all of you who are joining us here online, um, welcome, special welcome to you all. Um, just a quick reminder to please silence your cell phones. Um, for English 112, I think we have figured this uh, out at this point, um, but just remember the QR codes for the attendance for the class um, will be posted um, just right towards the end of the evening, so just make sure you scan those codes before you leave here tonight. Um, and just a reminder to everyone who's here um, that we have a bunch of exciting readings around the bend. Um, on November 7th, Yona Harvey will be reading poems as part of the Cromwell Day programming and will be here in conversation with Tiana Clark. And then um, already leaping forward to past Thanksgiving, um, but we're already looking forward to it. On November 28th, um, Matthew Olsman and Vivi Francis um, will be here too. So please stay tuned um, for that. Um, and now, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce my colleague and friend, Yona Harvey. So this normally would be the moment where I'd read from Yona's bio, listing her publications and many awards. But I already did that. I did that last month when uh, Yona was here for Ross Gay's reading. And then I have the honor of introducing Yona um, in two weeks' time when she's here for her own reading as part of the Cromwell Day programming. Um, so instead, I just want to say a few words about Yona as a colleague and just a presence on campus, um, because it speaks volumes about her um, as a colleague that um, just in the first few months of her time at Smith College, she will already have participated in three Poetry Center events. Um, I hope everyone here had a chance to listen to her absolutely fantastic dialogue with Ross Gay last month. And I know at the Poetry Center, we received so many messages and emails um, just praising Yona's terrific questions um, with Ross. Um, and for all the current Smithies who are here, I really hope you have a chance to experience Yona in the classroom. Um, since only a half semester into her time here at Smith, I know from speaking with um, many students across campus that she's already deeply beloved as a teacher here at Smith. We are so, so, so lucky to have her here as part of our campus community. Please welcome the astonishing and brilliant and joyous and all around wonderful Yona Harvey. Thank you so much for that. I, I don't know about all that, but OK. <laughs> it has been really wonderful to be here at Smith. Um, and one big reason is like being invited to be involved in the Poetry Center and to invite people like Tween. So yay. All right, I'm going to get right to it. Tween Das is a Bengali poet, activist, 
political columnist, short story writer, and essayist living in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He first came to the United States as a visiting scholar at Carnegie Mellon University, and then through City of Asylum Pittsburgh, became the International Cities of Refuge Network, or ICORN, writer in residence. In addition to its important political work on behalf of exiled writers, City of Asylum is known for its painted houses where many of the writers reside. If you're ever lucky enough to visit Pittsburgh's North Side Mexican War Streets neighborhood, it's very likely you'll encounter visitors eager to take a peek at these bright colored spaces decorated with poems and symbols, and in Tuin's case, birds and commas animated against a backdrop of bright green. Maybe he can talk a little bit later about the painting of that house. He has written that the sound of early morning birds chirping reminds him of his homeland, where birds woke him up every morning, and later lamented that with the memory of birds came the memory of his countrymen. That kind of bittersweet oscillation occurs often in Tuin's most recent poetry collection, Exile Poems in the Labyrinth of Homesickness. Walking down a mid-afternoon street, the poet says, I was born and raised in a green city, covered in trees. Pittsburgh is gray in comparison. Or a slice of lemon on his dining room table in Pittsburgh reminds him it's monsoon season back home in Bangladesh. Exile Poems is a meditative and resilient collection that captures the homesickness of life in exile while honoring the lives of murdered activists who fought against repression, censorship, and corruption. Das brings these fighters back to life with dignity, with dignity defiance, and artful grace. He was enchanted with poetry and writing at a young age, and his parents encouraged and supported his creativity, surrounding Tuin and his sister with books and magazines. He has quoted his father as saying, continue writing, continue with your protests, because one day it might work. Who knows? If you don't protest now, the next generation might be victims too. He has published eight, I think maybe nine now, collections of poetry, in addition to the articles and criticism written over many years. He has also written a collection of short stories. I feel deeply grateful to, <laughs> I feel deeply grateful that he took his father's advice, and it is my honor to welcome Tuin Das to the stage at Smith. <laughs> Thanks, Iona and Matt. Uh, so hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming tonight. And I am delighted to be here uh, with all of you. Uh, thanks to Poetry Center at Smith College for inviting me to read, and for the Lewis Global Studies Center and the Jandon Center for Community Engagement for their support. So it is a true, true pleasure to be here with all of you uh, this evening, and to those of uh, you uh, listening uh, in at home, through Facebook, and YouTube. So uh, tonight, uh, I will share poems from the uh, first book I have published uh, in English in the US, uh, Exile Poems in the Labyrinth of Homesickness, which was published uh, in May 2022 in English by Bridge and Tunnel Books. So before I share uh, my poems, uh, I, want, I want to uh, Feel emotional. <laughs> I want to share my uh, political background and uh, some information about my home country, Bangladesh, and myself that relates to the uh, book. Sorry. Okay. So I have divided my uh, presentation or uh, talk for this evening uh, in into uh, three parts. So they are uh, political background, uh, poetry reading, and conversation with uh, fellow poet, uh, Iona Harbe. So 
So I am from Bangladesh, uh, as you know, uh, which is an Asian nation, and it's surrounded by uh, India. So the population of Bangladesh, uh, like 170 million through the size of the uh, size of the country, is uh, smaller than the state of Iowa. So Islam is the official religion of Bangladesh, and 8% of the population is Hindu, and remaining 1% are Buddhist, Christian, or other re religions. So to understand uh, why I came to be uh, in the United States living in exile, it is helpful to know some of the historical context, like uh, my country, Bangladesh, was uh, originally part of British India. Since 1947, the Indian subcontinent was divided based on religions. Uh, India, which is the majority Hindu, and Pakistan, which is majority uh, Muslim. So at that time, Bangladesh became a section of Pakistan called uh, East Pakistan. So what we know currently as Pakistan was called uh, West Pakistan. So besides religion, there was also major differences with languages spoken in these areas, the cultures, and the histories. So West Pakistan tried to suppress us, means uh, Bengali people, and they took our asset, uh, East Pakistan's assets and money to build, develop West Pakistan's streets and infrastructures. Even the East Pakistani political leaders won the presidential election, but instead of transferring the power, the West Pakistani political leaders started a military campaign in East Pakistan, and that led to the Liberation War of 1971. So then East Pakistani guerrilla uh, freedom fighters won the war, and a new country emerged in the world called Bangladesh. And an Islamic political party called Jamaat Islam helped Pakistani army to kill three million people and other crimes against humanity. So I, uh, in 1985, I was born, and around that time, a military dictator announced Islam is the state religion. So, and, and the money was coming from Saudi Arabia and other Islamic countries to make society more Islamic. So throughout the 90s, society became more uh, Islamic, who is started to contradict my Bengali heritage and culture. So I was growing up and realized that my family and I were treated differently because my family practices the Hindu religion, and Hindus are a minority religion in Bangladesh. So in 2000, there was a general election in Bangladesh, and Islamic political party like Jamaat Islam formed a pact uh, with the main opposition party called Bangladesh National, Nationalist Party, or BNP, and they formed a government. So they were both right-wing and center-right-wing political parties. So we, the secular uh, liberal people of the country, were surprised to see the notorious war criminal uh, leaders became the ministers and law lawmakers of our country. So there was a, was a uh, post-election uh, religious minority persecution that happened throughout Bangladesh because these Islamic uh, political party members had hate in their mind because they were not able to come into power ever before. Hindu houses and temples were burned down, Christian churches were bombed, secular political activists were killed, and Hindu women were raped. So to protest this atrocity, I published my own magazine called Aronok or The Wild. So I and, uh, and other open-minded writers wrote articles and, and we wrote about various uh, political and social issues, such as against religious uh, persecution and Islamist fundamentalism, promoting peace and harmony between our two religious communities in Bangladesh. So then uh, the coalition government formed a political, politically elite uh, Polish force called Rapid Action Battalion, or RAB, to get rid of uh, opposition leaders and activists from the states. By then, the rap killed hundreds of political activists in the name of uh, crossfire or encounter or gunfight. 
So hundreds of political activists were kidnapped and disappeared by the RAB. The coalition government even awarded RAB an independence award. So a few writers started uh, to write about the danger of having a political police force. So I followed them and I started writing and publishing articles about RAB in my magazine. So I printed magazines and leaflets and distributed them. So then uh, in 2006, I was kidnapped by uh, RAB. I was detained nearly uh, 20 hours. I was blindfolded and beaten for uh, four hours uh, night. And I was released after I agreed with them that I would leave my uh, hometown, Borishal. After six months, there was a general election in Bangladesh and the Bangladesh National, National Par Nationalist Party and Jamaat Islami coalition lost the, lost the election and I returned to my hometown, Borishal. Aumi League, the uh, political party that led our liberation war, a, a trial started against the 1971 war criminals. Some of them were uh, Islamic leaders. Writers, activists, such as myself, supported the government in having the trial by forming human chains and staging street dramas, chanting slogans, and arranging candlelight vigils. In a few weeks, thousands of people joined in the protest and supported the secular government and support is spread to the all mean, this support is spread to the all the main cities in Bangladesh. So I joined in my hometown, Borishal, and organized by bringing people to the march and giving speeches and reading poetry. So, so Islamic political members from different uh, Islamic parties shared the same, same goals and started protest against us. Uh, they labeled us anti-Islamic and they provided our named name to the local militant outfits and like Al-Qaeda and ISIS and they, and this uh, uh, militant outfits started to publish the names of the protest leaders and organizers and writers and online influencers. At the same time, police were arresting the atheist writers to calm down Islamist. So my name appeared on a hit list published by local outfit of Al-Qaeda and I went to the police but uh, instead of helping me, the police took my writings and the password of my social media accounts and websites, and the detectives started to following me around the city for a few weeks. So under, I understood the leader of the uh, political party and secular government, uh, whom we previously supported, uh, they, they will not hel uh, help us or help me. So the government basically made uh, us escape goals to remain in power. So I decided to leave my hometown, Borishal, again. So it was 2015. So I left in the middle of, of the police investigation, and I went to different cities and kept myself under a low profile, and because of my name and photo appeared in the newspaper and on TV with other writers. Sorry, we are so speedy. <laughs> so in 2016, uh, when I was still hiding, I submitted my application to be a visiting scholar and accepted by the English language and department of Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh. And I was accepted by City of Asylum based in uh, Pittsburgh to join the Writer Sanctuary Program. So City of Asylum affiliated with the Norway-based organization ICON, International Cities of Refuse Network, which offers shelters to writers and artists at risk, advances freedom of expression, defends democratic values, and promotes international solidarity. So in 2021, uh, I was granted asylum by the US government. And uh, in April uh, 2022, my US debut book, uh, Exile Poems, was published by uh, Brisbane Tunnel Books. So I shared this information to give you historical con context to my situation. Uh, I think that's a lot. <laughs> so now I will share 10 poems from my uh, Exile Poems. 
So the poems are uh, translated by, uh, the poems are translated from my mother language, uh, Bengali, to English uh, by Arunabha Sinha, who is a professor of creative writing at Ashoka University in New Delhi, India. So I'm going to read uh, one poem, and before reading each, each poem, I'm going to talk about it. Uh, so between 2013 and 2018, more than 100 writers, uh, bloggers, and activists all demanded secularism in Bangladesh, uh, which meant they wanted more uh, personal freedoms and were threatened with death by Islamists. Among them, more, more than 50 people from different religions, ethnic groups, were victims of ruthless targeted killings. So in reaction, dozens of writers and activists now live, in, live their lives in ex exile in different countries around the world, including me. I am one of them. Exile poem one. All the writers were living under their threats. So why should I step back in my land? The thought kept floating up. The question like a corpse of a refugee lying on the coast by the sea, its existence irrelevant next to the vast expanse of water. I wanted to be that minority who would be the last to flee the country. So I left Bangladesh on the 1st of April uh, 2016. I was at the airport in the capital city, Dhaka, and completed my immigration proceedings. So I was waiting for boarding, and I called a few trust or the friends. But they say so it was April 1st, you know, uh, April Fool's Day. So, so but, but my friends, they thought I was pranking them because uh, it was the April 1st, which is the April Fool's Day, you know. So we normally prank each other. So I gave up trying to tell them I was leaving the country. Uh, because they, when they didn't believe me. <laughs> so, it was a, like a disaster. So at Abu Dhabi airport, uh, I felt nervous because I knew I was leaving my home country for such a long time, at least one or more decade. Uh, so the uncertainty caused me to feel vulnerable and powerless. And I just needed to see a familiar face at Abu Dhabi airport. Just I needed to like talk someone. So I didn't, but I didn't know anybody. Exile poems too. And then I did leave my country. I abandoned everything. My entire contemptible past. Passing on my journey, the silent sky, the river of fear and, and the farmland full of harvest of death, when I saw those who were sleeping at midnight in the Abu Dhabi International Airport, I thought of walking them to say, you are my own, each and every one of you. But my restless feet pressing down on the constantly moving escalator found no opportunity to pause. Okay, then it's in Pittsburgh in the US. <laughs> So when, I, when, I, when the car that picked me up from the Pittsburgh uh, airport and drove me to my new home at my new, at my exiled uh, residence in Pittsburgh, I was excited to see three robin bars, like bars, sitting on the electrical wire outside of the house. For the first time I, since I left my home country, I felt a connection to this distant land when I saw the bars. And that night I wrote the first poem of this book. Out of the Exile Poems 3, out of the Fort Pitt Tunnel, my first view of Pittsburgh, the way we killing to a new lover is how these three rivers joined with my feelings. On Samsonia way, the American robins warble sweetly on the wars. You have come here as well, bars, to welcome me. The trees in Osh Park give me shade all summer. So I want to share this uh, picture with you. Uh, so this is a picture of my former uh, home in Pittsburgh. This is 
I lived, lived in this place almost uh, more than seven years as an exile writer. And uh, so it is a part of city of asylums, uh, house publication, just as some of writers complete the exile artist program, they are invited to design the exterior of the house in which they have been living. So in November uh, 2021, my artistic design became the fifth house dedicated as part of this collection. So for this project, I began to experiment with uh, concrete poetry, writing poems in shapes to subject of the poem. The central poem of this mural is written in the shape of a giant comma. So the comma represents multiple themes related to pauses in the, in the passage of time and connecting people. So the front of the house is painted red and green, the colors of Bangladeshi flag. So this poem is about my uh, inner world. Uh, can we imagine I, I have rarely met a Bengali-speaking person uh, during one or two years? Uh, it is not easy uh, in Pittsburgh because there are not many people uh, in that city from Bangladesh. <laughs> so, so when I am at my apartment, I listen to uh, Bengali music and songs. Uh, I watch Bengali movies and I read Bengali books. So some of the biggest challenges that I have faced in America are cultural differences and isolation uh, from my native language. Exile Poems 4. As long as I am in my apartment, I do not remember that I am an alien abroad because I glide in Bangla, smile in Bangla, and live in Bangla. I read, I talk on the phone with my family back home. But when I open the door and I step outside to see a lowering, unfamiliar sky, I recall with a jolt that I am in a foreign land now. I walk a short way. When I see people on the road, I wish I could ask, can I lend you a song from my country? Is it possible to lend a song? We're a poet, so. <laughs> so this poem is about the winter, definitely <laughs> the first snowfall. Uh, I enjoyed first winter, even though I do not like winter anymore. <laughs> so the winter in North America is very cold, uh, freezing, bitter, and colorless, uh, lifeless. So walking on the snow, taking the bus, <laughs> navigating around, it is not fun to live in this part of America <laughs> in winter. So, Example poems five. No one but me lives in my apartment. From the December window, I watch the first snowfall. A beautiful, melancholy day, like a giant painting on a white canvas. That day, I do not even want to know the names of the flowers in the store. Just that, I love them. That I will love someone at first sight. I write these things in letters sent across countries to the new addresses of my friends. I do not know them. No, did they get them? So I wrote this poem almost uh, seven years, uh, seven years half ago. And this, mo like this morning also I was reading it and I was surprised to realize the elements of my poems are still valid and relevant. So yes, achieving uh, freedom is not easy. I have been working it for a long time. And I uh, look into the moon, and I think this is the same moon and stars that my uh, mother and my family members can look up to. So I know they are missing me too. Exile poem six, the sound of the seashores to these hills. I wait to hear it on the wind, a blinding white light light rouses me at midnight. When I open my eyes, impossible moonlight streams through the window. The sky is distinct, bright, but my future is shrouded in darkness, for my life in exile is dependent on the politics in this country. When I wake up very early, I wish I could take wings from the window of this two-storied house to fly towards the Kirtankhola River of my hometown. 
Yeah, my hometown, so you can see a real view of my, an aerial view of my hometown. <laughs> so this is the, uh, my hometown, a lot of water. <laughs> uh, but uh, life goes on, uh, life like a, a river and it does not stop for anyone. The things of my life that I have enjoyed most of my uh, life, uh, they are far away, uh, more than 8,000 miles. And my family, my cats, I had two cats. And my plants, uh, my books. Uh, so recently, even the furniture in my family's house has been repainted, you know, so life goes on. Exile poems seven. Asking questions from a distant seems so very simple today. Write down poetry notebook, my secret alphabet, laughter, and garlands of tears. I planted you, Karambola tree. How are you today? Have the books on the shelves been swiped away by dust already? Have my favorite cats forgotten me? Will I never see them again? With these questions in my mind, I stroll in the streets after dusk. A lot of questions in the head. <laughs> uh, I will not take much time. I will read another three poems. Uh, in this poem, I am uh, narrating my uh, dedication to complete my journey. A person's voice uh, goes quiet if the person cannot complete the journey. Uh, because we focus on celebrating the result of victory instead of the preservance uh, along the way. So example poems eight. It is much colder. Everyone is saying winter is here for real now. I pull my hat lower over my forehead. My joy is stiff. My eyes is still gazing into the distance. I see frigid full of self-confidence. The silence suits my writing life. That what is the person who spent all summer setting up fireworks in the sky? At 2 a.m. standing by the window, I jump at the sound of them going up. I keep, I keep looking for him. A human life is like fireworks. So being an uh, immigrant, I often uh, feel out of place because the struggles uh, to go from asylum seeker to citizen take a long time and a lot of attention to uh, detail. So when I wrote uh, this, uh, I was concerned that uh, my life passion and love for writing that I developed uh, in my ho home country, Bangladesh, would continue to be meaningful and successful to me and my readers uh, in the US. Excel Poems 9. Everyone is celebrating the new year. I do not know how many ways I can try to make the year meaningful, to make myself and my writing matter. I often answer my furative questions to myself with these words, I don't know the sound of fingers drumming on a bar. I see people trying different methods to hide their restlessness, unknown to themselves. When the migratory bars still return home in the evening, I do not know why I am surprised. Every journey ends in a return. Mine has not been born yet. So the last poem I will share this evening is about Borishal, uh, my hometown. So in my hometown, uh, there are many rivers, uh, canals, and uh, waterways, uh, which support the local economy with uh, fishing and trade. So when I first arrived, having uh, never lived outside uh, Bangladesh, I found myself searching for similarity in my life back home. 
So there are three rivers uh, in Pittsburgh. So I felt uh, comfort uh, to visit the three rivers that flow through uh, Pittsburgh and uh, enabled it to thrive uh, through the years. So I will uh, read uh, Excel poems 10 uh, first in my mother language, Bengali, and uh, followed by English, but that you can hear the sound and sensation uh, of my lang language. নির্বাসিত কবিতা দশ নদীর কাছে গিয়ে দাঁড়াই বুঝতে চেষ্টা করি কোথায় মনঙ্গা হিলা নদীর হৃদয় রয়েছে দিনে ও রাতে তার দুরকম বয়ে চলা যেভাবে প্রেমের ঋতুতে তোমার নিজস্ব নারীটি লাবণ্যময় হয়ে ওঠে বিদেশি নদীর মুখ দেখে যায় না কিছু বোঝাতে এমন আমি যদি তোমার মুখ দেখে বুঝতে না পারি তাহলে কে বুঝবে বলো আমি মানুষের মুখের থেকে অসুখ বেশি দেখেছি রক্ত বেশি দেখেছি এক্সাম্পল পয়েন্টস টেন আই গো আপ টু দ্য রিভার পজ অ্যান্ড ট্রাই টু ফ্যাদম হোয়ার দ্য হার্ট অফ দ্য মনঙ্গা হিলা লাইজ ইট ফলোস ডিফারেন্টলি বাই ডে অ্যান্ড বাই নাইট জাস্ট অ্যাজ আওয়ার লাভার গ্রোজ বিউটেশিয়াস ইন দ্য সিজন অফ লাভ ফরেন রিভার্স ডু নট রিভেল মাস টু মি If I can't read their faces, then who can? I have seen more illness, I have seen more blood, then I have seen people's faces. So I hope you have uh, enjoyed the reading, and now I will be joined by uh, Iona Harvey, who is a fellow poet and former Peace Burger, <laughs> and uh, is the professor of uh, poetry in the Department of English and Language and Literature at Smith. Uh, thank you. Oh yeah, do this. Okay, I think I need maybe help. Uh -oh. <laughs> Sorry. I'm not that much technology. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you again for being here. Thank you for that talk and the reading. Um, one of the things that I admire about you is the way that you always give the context. You know, you put things in context before you present for the reading, so yeah, thank you for that. I thank you so, so much cool. for inviting. Yeah. Um, wow, I, let's just, um, can you tell us a little bit about City of Asylum, Pittsburgh, you know, for people who don't know what it is, can you talk about that a teeny bit and what the mission of the organization is? Yeah, I think City of Asylum uh, is a, uh, Pittsburgh-based non-profit organization who are affiliated with a networking organization uh, called International Re uh, 
refuse, refuse network in Norway, and they give uh, city of asylum and this network uh, who are affiliated with these cities, and they give uh, shelters to the writers and artists at risk. Uh, so in, I think it, uh, these programs are affiliated with most of, a uh, lot of, uh, in European countries and also in the, here in the U US. So City of Asylum is the US head headquarter of uh, ICON. So yeah, it is uh, located in Pittsburgh uh, in a be very beautiful and historic neighborhood, uh, old neighborhood. And City of Asylum has like a, some, of, some row houses and they provide uh, those houses uh, as a shelter, uh, shelter space for the writer. They, can, they invited for uh, so this is the one of the like a long uh, long term residency in the US. I do not know much about uh, is there any other organization in the US they provide this much long long term. I was there almost with, the, with them seven years and a half. That's very long, and they provide like uh, a stipend, uh, support for attorney, uh, all the medic med medical expenses, whatever need to. Uh, start a journey here. So their, their main mission is basically protect and celebrate uh, artist freedom around the world. And uh, uh, they try to create a just world. Thank you. I think we were talking earlier about when we first met. I know it was through some City of Asylum event. They're very good with programming and involving the local community or educating the community about what's happening there so yes uh, city of asylum has like a uh, they're doing uh, more than 150 programs uh, during the uh, year uh, like a uh, poetry reading jazz concerts uh, film uh, where they're bringing uh, city of asylum is bringing a lot of artists uh, nationally and internationally and yeah i think uh, peace burgers the community they're very happy to uh, hear from this artist uh, in Pittsburgh uh, at their like a doorstep. So I know City of Asylum has a bookstore, so it's very, very, very nice place, yeah. Okay. <laughs> we'll maybe loop back to that a little bit later. Um, I want to ask you a little bit about this book. So in the preface to the exile poems, you write that still there remain agonies that I cannot express in my daily journal, my fiction, my political columns, or my surrealist drawings. You do a lot, you have a very artistic background. Um, but, and that you, but you can capture these feelings, these agonies instead in poetry. So can you talk a little bit about the mode of writing in poetry and what it allows you to access that maybe other modes of writing or art do not? Yeah, I think that was a, like a, one of my favorite po uh, question for that I was a little bit smiling. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I think uh, I consider myself as a, like a prolific writer. <laughs> that means I write a lot and uh, like I, I write uh, different, uh, in, in different genres. Uh, like journal, journalistic columns, I write articles, uh, poetry, uh, articles about poetry, uh, short stories, I wrote novel. So, and I was writing all of this also in this residency at City of Asylum throughout last few years. Uh, but I was, I was feeling that something is missing. I, I could, couldn't express like 100% uh, what I'm trying to say. And for, the, for those uh, contexts and uh, those stories, maybe, uh, poetry is a good form for me for writing all of these uh, uh, stories, maybe. So yeah, then basically I started to write this book, uh, putting aside. Uh, other writing at that time I, I had. Is it? I'm gonna keep. I'm gonna press you a teeny tiny bit more. Like, is it an? Is it an? Is it about emotion? Is it about space? Is it about imagination? You know, 
I, I think definitely there is emotion. Without emotion, we cannot write, maybe, I think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How can we write uh, without emotion about anything or attachment with anything? Yeah, I was going through like a mixed feelings. Like, uh, I think I came to this country and uh, I, I am celebrating my uh, freedom of expression here. Uh, also, by writing this book, I am also uh, continuing the to practice freedom of expression. But in the same time, I was missing uh, my home and uh, all the things I left behind, uh, the belonging, you know. So, so it, these two things are like sometimes contradict, you know. So I think then basically poetry comes from that contradiction of my those emotion, yeah. And I was feeling like writing on a paper is kind of uh, healing the process, process of healing for me to continue uh, go forward also, other than the skip inside, in my, inside me. Okay. Slightly, maybe connected to that. Um, so last, I think, well, roughly around this time last year, you visit a group of graduate students virtually in California. And I think I'm gonna paraphrase a little bit, like one of them asked you, if it was traumatizing or triggering for you to talk about the conditions that you fled in Bangladesh. It's a, par a slight paraphrase, but you responded that it's actually more helpful for you to speak up and that you don't want to keep silent. Uh, can you elaborate on that a little bit more and maybe even like what Americans might take for granted about free speech and free expression? Yeah, at the end, it's not only about like personal. It's also like uh, sometimes we also go through uh, collective tra trauma. Like I, I am there, there are other writers from different countries, and there are lots going on in the other side of the world. And uh, as I said, I am here, I, I have ability or uh, I'm t talking about it because I am here. I, if I am in Bangladesh, you are not, no one is going to, you are not going to hear anything from me because, uh, yeah, so for that also I think uh, it is important to uh, write about it, talk about it, and finding out, uh, the shed a light on it, what is happening there, and also finding out a way to help other people. Like, uh, we, we writers are helping each other uh, as a community. Uh, artists are helping each other to go through this. Uh, like, you know, freedom of expression in Bangladesh. There, there is no freedom of, of expression in Bangladesh, India, or Pakistan. And I do not consider these countries as a democratic country, never. So, yeah, so. Um, I don't know. I, I think we would have time, but only if you're comfortable doing this. Um, I'm thinking about exile poem number 29 and exile poem number 64. Uh, would you be willing to read both of those poems? In English? <laughs> In English. Uh, you said 29 and? 64. Okay, I hope I remember. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, These are long poems. <laughs> no, maybe not. It's fine. Uh, okay. Only, only if you feel comfortable. You don't. No, have no, to no I'm it. good. I, I can still I, ask the question if you don't. No, I got got chance to read poems. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is uh, number twenty nine. Is a poem I meet with someone at a uh, mid section of a of the grocery store in Pittsburgh, and uh, he was a professor in his country, but he couldn't continue that profession here for some reason. And he became a, like a um, worker at the store, so. Exile poem 29. At the midsection of the grocery store, I was served by a middle-aged asylum seeker. He did not know a great deal of English. In his country, he was a philosophy professor. Make, make some time one of these days, I told him, for us to go watch a movie. He wanted to know whether the film would include bloodshed. Apparently, he breaks into shops when he sees blood, and yet, to learn earn a living now, he has to slice meat.
Example poem 64. Oh, this is a poem uh, about, this poem was written in the remembrance of a Bangladeshi American writer, uh, Obhijit Roy. And in, to, in 2015, he was stabbed to death uh, by the Islamic uh, militant in Bangladesh. Exile poem 64. The militants killed the free thinker in the darkness of faith, but he is not alone now. On the shores of many vast oceans, I see the giant water columns bowing to him. He has no complaints, clutching his throat with one hand every day he holds his glass out to us with the other. The more the days pass, the more he shines like a star in our wide sky of knowledge, glowing with his own luster. They wanted to kill me too. They wanted to bath me in blood. Such blind equations and injustice will make the rivers dry up, makes the flowers wilt before sunset. Wildering their pains, the writers of my country hold their heads high. You, just, you write so much about the power of words and what the pen can do. Um, I, so I, I asked you to read them. Thank you so much for reading them. I'm sorry to put you on the spot. Um, because literally, the poetry, I feel like your poetry, like has the power to bend time and raise the dead. Like, I feel like the book is so much, has so much evidence of that. Um, how conscious are you of your role as a poet, like when you're composing these poems? And how would you describe that role of a poet? Yeah, so I think uh, I am a conscious person as I like to bring social change. Uh, when I'm writing, maybe I'm writing in, uh, when I'm writing is emotions uh, is affiliated, but uh, I am editing later. I am, I am basically uh, more conscious about the power of words. How can I make it uh, direct? Uh, how can I connect with the readers more? Uh, and how can I spread my basically words to next generation because they are the Leaders are coming, and they are going. They are going to bring the change. And yes, I am writing this uh, after a few years when they are going to question us. What did you do? I said I, I did my. I tried my to do my job. So yeah, I I am I am I, uh, sure I am aware of that. So thank you. Um, not to. I don't want to be like overly serious. I think you also have a really great. Uh, sense of humor and playfulness about you. So I'm gonna ask a question around that too, in terms of especially language in the book. So you have these moments where there's a lot of joy and subversion in the language. So Pittsburgh is sometimes written as Peaceburg. Uh, you talk about people getting high blood pressure and then you talk about how when you get wound up, you get high writing pressure. Um, you flip the word activism and it becomes rightivism. And a lot of this reminds me too of like Rastafarians in Jamaica in the 1950s who would also press, you know, that language. So like the Queen's English, it would get flipped and, you know, so uh, a word like overstand would be replace, understand, down presser instead of oppressor. So like changing the tone of the word. Um, how, conscious are of, how conscious of that kind of play are you with your? Yeah, I think uh, I, I am aware of that. And uh, as I think, um, you know, I did a lot of experiment for my, uh, when I was writing, when I'm writing the poetry in my home language. Uh, like uh, when I was thinking, oh, should I write this poem in English? But I don't want to write uh, poems uh, in in English. Yeah? I want to write it in Bengali, and I want, yeah. So I don't want to take take away a job from the translator. Uh, I am not good with that. So, uh, 
so I did. Uh, I created a lot of new words. Uh, when I, or I create when I write poetry. Sometimes I think it's work. Sometimes it's not. But I try to create. So there is a lot of uh, experiment. I am still doing with my uh, Bengali writing. Uh, here are, you can see maybe in the preface a uh, few words. But there are a lot, basically more than this. Uh, yeah, I, I, I feel like. Uh, the immigrants uh, come from far away and live in this uh, promised land <laughs> and uh, to find peace. But uh, I feel sometimes at the end, sometimes they don't find it. Uh, they feel feels they find more cruelty in separation with their family members. So for that, I was thinking, oh, I can write the. Word change the word to Pittsburgh, uh, yeah, like that. So, yeah, and also act activism. Uh, the kind of like I was, thinking, I was activist in Bangladesh, uh, so writing was also my uh, tool to protest too. So, just a uh, different taking out different meanings. So, can you talk a little, can you talk a little bit about tr the process of translation and maybe what you think? Get, well, your experience working, yeah, and what gets lost, absolutely. I think uh, in trans translation, uh, nothing gets lost. I, f I think uh, we get more. We get more, I think. Uh, like, uh, my, the, the process of translation was with my translator is, was very, like, uh, communicative, I want to say, like, interactive. Uh, I sent manus manuscript from here, and he is living in like far away. But uh, he translated it, he sent it back, and uh, I went through it again. And it was like so many times. At the in, at one time, he said, "Okay, Tohin, you should, you can stop maybe now." <laughs> but uh, we, we did a lot of work, and still, uh, I'm working on new poetry book, and uh, he is still translating the book. Uh, difference. Uh, yeah, when I was editing the book, uh, I, I feel like there, there was, I, I felt sometimes there is a difference between who, um, uh, us, like, is uh, writing this word. So then I said, said to him, hey, I think uh, here this line or these words are not expressing uh, what I was trying to say. Then basically he sent me. Uh, Different word or uh, yeah so yeah and but but I, I, overall basically uh, I'm very happy with the uh, outcome of the book yeah it's, it's very very close to my think my thinking and my writing what I did so and he he is one of the uh, like a great translator in from Bang, uh, Bengali to English right now in that world he's very uh, like prolific translator he published every month one book and from the all major uh, publication houses in, in India, Delhi, so. Okay. Yeah. And am I remembering correctly that you wouldn't necessarily work with the same translator for fiction collection that you worked with in poetry or a tough question. <laughs> uh, the way it worked, like I, uh, there are, uh, I worked with other translators uh, here, uh, but I worked with like some short projects, like articles. I didn't do like a full collection yet. Uh, as, I, as, as I was talking before with you, like I had a uh, novel uh, that I wrote in this residency. Uh, it's like a, uh, it is not translated yet. I'm looking for translators, as you know. Yeah, but uh, I'm open with basically anyone who wants to. Uh, work with me or I want to work, so it's fine. But uh, as I said, uh, I'm writing another book. And basically, he is also, uh, Oru Nabushingho, he is the translator currently for that book. And yeah, I'm looking forward to work with more uh, persons. So yeah, so. Let's see. I'm trying not to ask all these really long <laughs> questions. Um, but OK. I'll, uh, this is also connected maybe to um, the two poems that I asked you to read before. 
your Bengali identity is very crucial um, to you. And can you say more about why, especially given that um, your family was part of the Hindu minority in Bangladesh? Yeah, so as I said, uh, like I was growing up in Bangladesh. Uh, I was a, I was a uh, child from a minority community. It was different. It, it, we had, I was treated uh, differently at the school uh, in my neighborhood. Uh, growing, growing up was not was a strange. My growing up was a strange. Like uh, it, it was not a normal kid uh, in Bangladesh, and um, like, but I grew up and. Uh, the religious identity, I was never by tasked by that. Uh, I always thinking there is bigger than bigger than that. That was my way of thinking. And I, I think I got that by reading books and all the writers and philosophers around the world. I read, read those translations. I, this is then basically I have uh, concluded uh, or I landed to that uh, thinking. So. Th so like as I said, I started publishing my uh, poetry magazine uh, when I was only 16 years old. And uh, in pa first year, I published like six issues. And, <laughs> and uh, from then, then on, I was, I, I was almost like sure I'm not going to carry on uh, religious identity. Other, I will carry on the identity really uh, I belong from the land. I, I really belong from the environment, from the water, from the language, uh, from the, like anything is from nature. So yeah, for, as a Bengali, like uh, we have different uh, culture, you know, so those like village fair, we have a different very uh, thing, colorful uh, New Year celebration and uh, like we, we are the one of the nation who fought for our language in 1952, and we against Pakistan, and they tried to suppress us. They said you cannot speak in your own language. Can you imagine if someone come to your country and says you cannot speak in your English? So that's totally like a. But we fight against that, and in 1971, we also my PBS generation, not me. My previous generation fought for their freedom and against Pakistan and they own. And that means I was growing up by hearing poetry and song about this freedom, freedom, freedom fighting movement or liberation movement and also uh, like mother, mother language day movement. So I was growing up by this and I was being basically created uh, like a new uh, person, like a, a secular person uh, who does not uh, just people other to see just a, by their religion or by their out outlook, by their clothes. So. Thanks. Yeah. I, feel, I won't, um, okay, I'll pivot a little. <laughs> Last, I just have like two more questions. You talk about being self-taught in terms of making poems mm -hmm. and making art. And then you also, there's a, also a period where you talk about like not being so caught up, cu caught up in art collection anymore. That's like a tangential thing. But can you talk about your process of making things, like how you make poems, how you make art? And that's more for the students and you know, beginning poets, beginning writers, beginning artists. What can you tell them about that process? Uh, I think it's basically everyone has maybe different process, uh, as personal or uh, collaborative. But uh, for me, uh, I think it comes from the emotion. One thing, and now I am getting older, and day by day I feel it's from the experience, uh, and also. Uh, Maybe some b both, you know. So, so the way I write, I take notes. That's the one way I do. But uh, the, I get the idea poem somehow. Like I'm just walking or I'm doing something. Then I got the suddenly idea. 
then basically I develop it for in my uh, brain. I, I, I try to develop it, uh, then basically I write it down. When it gets a little bit shape, then I write it down. I still write on the paper by pen. I cannot write poetry, first draft at least on the computer, I can't, or Google Drive in these days. <laughs> so I, <laughs> yeah, we are Google Drive, uh, very, very <laughs> dependent on. So, <laughs> so uh, I write it on paper, and then basically I composed, uh, I put in on Google Drive or in uh, computer, a laptop I use. And then basically I, I, I edit it uh, for how many times it is needed. Uh, yeah, that's, that's the way I work. So I got the idea, and I take notes, and yeah, and I basically, uh, yeah. Do you? Okay, I lied. There's really three. There's a follow. There's a follow up just to that. Like in terms of the community at City of Asylum or elsewhere, you know, are there people you're showing your work to, or is it more? Is it you and your translator, or? Is there, are there other people you're sharing your work about, with? Talking about book? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I think so. There are my friends. Uh, I think I do torture on them. <laughs> when I write something new, uh, I think I, I, I try to uh, read to them and try to see, as an American person at first, uh, what the things. Is it really Odi? <laughs> or I, I think uh, try to understand what they are on to hear. Uh, sometimes, yeah, so I edit, read it to my friends, and then when I feel, okay, this, I need to edit these things, and then I edit, edit them, those places, and then I share with, basically, an editor. So there are, I work with different uh, editors, and uh, they help me. And yeah, so they, they, they like my writing, and uh, they like my writing, and they help me to... Uh, edit it and basically I do like a, at least uh, go through twice uh, for editing process and then basically I try to submit it to the magazine. So like in this poems, this book, the poems of this book, uh, most half of the poem was, poems were published in different magazines at first by that I try to understand what I'm writing really. Uh, I'm able to put into whether something or not. So yeah, it took a long time to understand that and put this book in this form, in this shape. So I, yeah, I share with uh, my friends and the uh, uh, editors and the also uh, magazine editors. Yeah. I guess I'll share with the audience that there are actually a lot of really incredible questions and conversations that. Um, you know, frame the poem. So lots of questions that I don't ask up here, they're asked in the book, so you should definitely. I, I, I think uh, there is also like a reading group guide at the end of the bo book. Uh, that one could be maybe also helpful, yeah. It's really that, good. That, that reading group guide was basically written, written by uh, my book editor, yeah, so. Okay. It's very good, I'm not just saying that because he's here, it's very, so you should definitely check it out. And my final, question is just, you know, what did I miss? What did we not cover? Is there anything that you want to say without me just tossing it at, at you? Anything you want to say before you go? Uh, yeah, write and uh, <laughs> write more and write more. <laughs> and if you see something wrong and uh, talk about, uh, protest about it. If you feel you need support, talk with your friends and say, how can you uh, protest about it? Protesting is important. And uh, yeah, as I said, I was, I was talking about it, uh, like the young generation is the, basically the leader in the future, and uh, we're hoping, hoping on you. And uh, we, we feel like we can uh, create a just world uh, together. So that's all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much.